Well, we've been in our uh, series on uh, Be Not Deceived. We're going to continue on with that. Is that okay? You've been helped a little bit about that? Yes. Say, I'm not deceived. I'm not deceived. And I'll never be deceived. I'll never be deceived. In, Jesus' name. in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're using as our text passage, our foundational passage to spring us into our series, Matthew 24. In this uh, familiar passage of Scripture where Jesus gave a, a whole discourse and a whole teaching or a whole uh, form of instruction to those that were around him about things that would come in the future. And we know if Jesus said it would come, it absolutely will come. Amen. And we find in Matthew 24, verse number one, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they're there at Temple Mount. That's where they're at. And he told them some things that would, would happen there. That, that was fulfilled. That one stone upon another um, was fulfilled in 70 A.D. That's already happened, you know. And in verse number three, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. So he said these things publicly to a degree, however many were there. It wasn't a sermon on the Mount, so it wasn't a multitude, but there were people around. And his disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? So when? is what, he's, what they're asking, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they ask him three distinct, specific questions. Amen? When, what, and the end of the world? They ask him about those things. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. And so he began a, a, a thing where he talks about wars and rumors of wars and all sorts of things that would come. And uh, I've said this to you before, it's worth saying again, that this was a, a statement or a teaching or a release of a prophetic utterance, if you will, primarily to the Jews. And it's between the rapture of the church and the appearing of the Lord Jesus. And they are different. Those are two different events. So these are the, are the events that are in between that. So it's not something that's going to happen to you because you'll be gone in heaven before this happens. If you're a believer, amen, that's important because a lot of people see this and they get all nervous. Well, are we in that? No, we're not in that. But it is coming. And it's specifically something related to the Jews. Now, there's a few little comments we need to make here because he asked those things, and when you see here the end of the world, that word world is better translated age. What shall be the signs and what shall be related to the end of the age? Now we know it has to be something other than the world as we know it, because the Bible tells us in a number of places, but you can take Ephesians um, chapter 3, verse 21, and it says that it will be a world without end. This world, as you know it, will change, but the foundation of this world will always exist. This world eternally will exist. Amen? As a matter of fact, you're going to live out your eternity on the earth. You say, well, I'm going to live it out in heaven. Well, you will to a point, but heaven is coming to earth. Amen. You read Revelation 21 and 22. That's what's coming. And God the Father moves his throne to earth. So this world will never end. Now, it's going to get a major overhaul. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. So it gets a change, but it'll never end. That's important to know. Because the people talk about, well, the end of the world. Well, there's not going to be an end of the world. <laughs> well, you're one of those end of the world prophets. No, it's, no, it's not going to end. You know, you see those people with those sandwich boards in the cartoons, you know, the, the, the world's coming to an end. The world's going to end tomorrow. Well, no, it's not. 
So you can lift up your head knowing the world is not going to end. But the first thing that Jesus said as he took them into the actual events that would happen, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, and he taught about those things, and there will be great tribulation and all those things. Before he went into any of that, he gave them a, a cautionary note, and he said, take heed that no man deceive you. And so that passage right there gives us the, the basis for this series, Be Not Deceived. Now, I want to talk to you today about protection from deception. Protection from deception. Say that out loud. Protection from deception. And so we go through that fundamental truth. We know it's real because Jesus told us it would be. But now in Revelation chapter 12, in verse number 9, and the great dragon was cast out. Now we get a little uh, more insight into the great dragon. It says the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. So the great deceiver is the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. He's the deceiver. Say the devil is the deceiver. deceiver. Which deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels cast out with him. Now these angels, there was in other place in scripture, it tells us that there was a third of the angels that fell. And so they assist the devil in the great deception. They work for him. They have a hierarchical structure. We can see that in the book of Ephesians, that there's principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly place. So they have a structure. They borrowed the God structure. And they implemented it into that evil dark kingdom. So there's a structure in God's kingdom. Angels, there are various types of angels. There are various angels of different authority. There are different angels. There's archangels. There's certain uh, personal angels. It's talked about a child. It says their angel is ever before the Lord. So you, you hear the term guardian angel. Well, that's true. Well, when you were born, an angel was assigned to you. Now, you may have them not working for you. To have one assigned to you doesn't mean they're going to protect you from everything. If you do the wrong things, they'll let you. But they are assigned to you to help you. And when you grew up, they didn't go away. You ever see that picture? You, you, you see it on it's all kinds of places you see it, but there's this, there's this angel watching this children as they're crossing this bridge kind of out in the woods. You ever see that? I mean, you know, there's truth in that. We say, well, why do people get hurt? Well, there's lots of reasons. The Bible says the angels hearken unto the voice of the word of God. If there's no voice of the word of God given, and who gives God's word voice in the earth? You do. And you say the wrong things, you'll get the wrong things. Now that's a whole other teaching for a whole other time, but we may need to do that one. We need to talk about angels maybe a little bit, but that today's not the day for that. But they do exist, and then there are fallen angels. And Satan, some believe that he was the highest angel in heaven. Number one, because he said, I will exalt my throne above the most high. Big mistake. But he was in a position to where he thought he could actually do that. So that shows you what kind of power he had. Some believe, and it's reasonable to believe it, some believe, now he was Lucifer before he became Satan, before he became the devil. And some believe that he was the angel of the Lord. I don't know that he was, but he lost that. He lost his position. 
and he fell. And this is what it's talking about here. He and his angels were cast down. Amen. They lost their position. But it tells us here that the devil, Satan, is the deceiver. And he actually has the power and will have the power to deceive the whole world. Now that the whole world today is living under this deception. In the remnant church, those that are full of the Holy Spirit, those who understand the word of God, are his biggest problem. We are the ones that keep him at bay. That do not allow him to get by with what he wants to do. Through our prayers, through our binding and loosing, through the proclamation of the word, we set territorial boundaries for him. And he has no defense against the word of God. None. The word of God has a prevailing power over him. And that's why he hates you the way he hates you. Because you stop him from doing what he wants to do. But there is a mist over the whole planet. The Bible says that uh, th this, this darkness, this web that he entangles us with, there's a mist of darkness, a mist, mist of darkness over the whole earth that Satan releases to blind men to the truth, to the truth. And so you, you tell the truth to people and they can't even see it. They can't even see it. I'm talking about protection from deception. Amen. And so here we see, you know, the word world up here again is age. But here uh, we saw that in Matthew 24, world being age. And we see world down here, which actually means the globe, the planet. So there's different, different words. Okay. And so uh, deception is how he gets done what he gets done. Deception is how he rules in any environment. He has to hide in stealth. He has to get what he gets done in the shadows. He wants to tell you he doesn't exist. He wants to tell you that this whole thing about Satan is just a myth. The devil's not real. There's no, no such thing as right and wrong. It's just the way things work. There's no real force of evil in the earth. Yeah, he tells you that so he can get by with, undercover, what he wants to do. And if you do begin to discover there's some spiritual activity, he'll tell you God did it. Oh, God's the one that made you go broke because he wanted to teach you some. Oh, God's the one that's making you sick when the whole time it's him. You know what God's will is when you look forward to heaven where there's no sickness, no dying, no suffering. The will of God is that because he said the will of God be done in the earth as it is in heaven. So sickness is not God's will and God doesn't do it. The devil's behind it. Sickness never existed till sin entered. Before sin entered, there was no sickness. So sickness is the result of sin. Now, it might not be your sin. You say, well, is the fact that I'm sick, does it mean that I sinned? It could. I mean, I'd check up on that if I needed healing. I'd probably go take an evaluation. But you can evaluate to the point where it turns into condemnation. And that's not good and healthy for you. So it might not be your sin, but it is at least Adam's if it wasn't yours. Because sin's behind every sickness. You can rest sure of that. All of it. Period. Amen. I said amen. And uh, so here we find again that uh, <laughs> Satan is the master of deception. It says Satan deceives the whole world. He blinds the minds of people lest they receive the light of the glorious gospel. He has to blind us to keep us from seeing. Now, again, we find over here in Matthew. Uh, now, it's, it's interesting, this word world, you find in uh, Revelation 12 and 9. If you look that word up in the Greek, you'll find one shade of meaning. It, it means the world, like it says. That's obvious. 
But when you break it down, it's really your world. It's not just the world as a whole. It is that. It can be that. But it also means your particular world. Now, it even gets more personal because one of the meanings in the Greek is the word house. Everybody say house. Now, when I saw that and I looked it up and I was thinking about that and meditating it, it just brought me directly to this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 12. In verse number 43, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. Hmm. So here we have the devil at work, an unclean spirit, and working with a man. So we have the devil and a human somehow connected. Amen? It says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through the dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. And he said, I will return into my house. Hmm. Interesting word, isn't it? Since he said that he deceives the whole world, and one of the shades of that meaning of the word world is house. Interesting here, isn't it? Interesting words. He said, I will return to my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Now, this is talking about a person who's actually demon possessed. They're possessed by a spirit. Now, remember, that's the work of darkness. That's what Satan wants to do. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, and I don't say this with any pleasure, but I do say it with, with a, a need to feel like you need to enlighten some things. You see the vast majority of people who are, are, are mentally uh, deranged or a lot of people who are homeless, who have lots of problems that way. I don't say in every case, but I say in many cases, they're demon possessed. Well, now, I don't know if I believe that. Well, then you don't believe right. And their deliverance is based on a lot of things. You can, you can tell them, well, just say no all you want to. Well, they can't just say no. They got to help have some help saying no. You understand that? Because that thing's stronger than they are. You remember when Jesus had to go over the lake and he found that what was called the madman of Gadara, that's how we refer to him. Actually, it tells us in one place when he went over there, there were two of them, but it only gives us the deliverance of one of them. And it says that he was naked and in the tombs cutting himself and he was fierce and everybody was afraid of him and they'd bind him with chains and he'd break them. That's supernatural power given by an evil spirit. And it took the power of the living God to break that off of him. It wasn't just something that he could just say no to. It was strong and it was powerful and he needed a deliverance. Now I'm going to tell you really, drugs really guys are one of the major ways people open the door to that. I mean that's a number one way. Not the only way, but it's a number one way. And I'm going to tell you another way people open the door to sexual perversion. What happens in Vegas doesn't just stay in Vegas. It'll come, it'll come home with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like it. I don't care whether you like it or not. I told you the truth. And you wonder why you're carrying around all that stuff? I'm not saying you. I'm just saying the generic you, whomever that may fit. But you can't just do things and have no consequence. There's consequence to it. I'm talking about being not deceived. You know, we're talking about how it works. Why don't we just talk about how it works then, huh? That's how people get in these messes. I heard a story, uh, and it, it's a true story. The person who told me this, um, I know them very, very well. They're in heaven now, but I know they didn't lie to me about it. And they were talking about a young man who had a, 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 a spirit of sexual perversion on him. It just something it just it was just awful, you know. And, and, and the demons just dogging him and, and and just running him amuck. He couldn't get free, couldn't get free, and couldn't get free. 
And, and you know what the young man, he finally did get free, but you know when he said it came on him? He said he was streaking. Going to have fun. Going to shock everybody. Going to do something, probably a dare, something like that. And he, he was streaking, and that spirit came on him, and he couldn't get rid of it. Well, that's innocent fun. No, it's not. You may think it's innocent fun. Remember, we're talking about the deceiver. You open the door, you get what you get. Well, I got more than I wanted. Well, that's usually the way it goes. That's usually the way it goes. Well, let's read on here. He said, the unclean spirit's gone out of a man and walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. And he saith, I will return unto my house. And he called the man his house. Okay. From whence I came out, and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. In other words, a person can get free from a spirit. And if they don't fill the house back up, and I'm going to tell you how you have to fill it back up. You better fill it up with the Word of God. That's what you better fill it up with. And you better fill it up with the name of Jesus. And you better plead the blood. And you better do the things you need to do. If you don't do the things to stay clean, you won't stay clean. I don't care if you've been made clean. Getting clean is not staying clean. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe a Christian can have a demon. Well, do you believe a demon can have a Christian? Because they do. You can't, have a, you can't have a demon in your spirit, but you're a three-part being. You do have a soul and a body. And I'm going to tell you what's more, since I'm on this, a lot of sicknesses are demons. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. And people, you, they, they, get a, they get a spirit of infirmity on them and, and, and high blood pressure turns into a heart attack and heart attack turns into cancer and cancer turns into gout and gout turns into my back hurts. I mean, and, and you get rid of one, you get another. Now that's pretty, that's a, probably a spirit at work there. It sure got quiet in this church right then. God wants you well. He doesn't want you living under that oppression. You know, I mean, things happen to everybody. I know that. And the body's not yet redeemed. We're still, we're not glorified yet. I know that. But God said he'd take sickness from our midst and the number of our days he'd, we'd fulfill. Well, if he said that, I guess he meant it. That's a part of your covenant, you know. You don't need healing when you go to heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. The lack of healing is probably what, what got you to heaven. A lot of them go on the early bus too, before your time. You know that 70 and 80 thing that, that you find over there in Psalms where it says, you know, the, well, the number of our days, you know, we got 70 or 80 years. The man who wrote that, and that was inspired by the Spirit of God, remember this? Okay, but the man who wrote that was Moses. He's the one that wrote that very psalm. Lived to be 120. And he was complaining to God about the shortness of life at 70 or 80. So we're shooting as our target longevity, 70 or 80, and this man, Moses, is complaining that it's too short. So you need to know those scriptures that God didn't promise you 70 or 80. He told you 120. Actually, he told you he'd satisfy you with long life. I don't know if I'd want to be to live to be 120. You yeah, know, it depends on a few things. But I don't think you ought to settle down for 70 and say I'm done. But see, we buy that stuff. And in your body will absolutely respond to your faith. Will absolutely respond to those things if you believe that. If you embrace that, your body will accommodate you. And at 70, you'll start breaking down.
But he said he'd renew your youth like the eagle, so why don't you believe for a renewed youth? <laughs> Amen. So, okay. He said, the house from whence I came out, he has come and findeth it empty, swept and garnished, then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. That's what I said, getting clean is not staying clean. See, there are people who get clean, but they don't stay clean because they don't fill the house up with something that puts that spirit at bay. You better fill yourself up with the Word of God. You better, you better get on the Word of faith is what you better get on. Not just Don't start reading the book of Leviticus. You better get in your New Testament covenant and you better understand who you are in Christ Jesus and what Christ Jesus is in you and who lives in you. You better understand that and put that in your mouth and know what to do with that and dare the devil to do anything about it. I mean it. Then you can stay clean. But you can be a you know you can be a Hebrew scholar and know all the ins and outs of the book of you know Rev, uh, the book of Leviticus. Now I'm not minimizing the importance of the book. I'm just telling you that's not the one that reveals your covenant to you. <laughs> you better get on your covenant. You better believe it. And you better stand on. You are bought with the blood, and you need to know how to use that, and you need to know how to stand for that. You can study the Bible for years and know nothing. But you get on the right stuff and it doesn't take long. You can grow up quick. You get on the right stuff. That's the truth. I mean, it's this word of faith which we preach. Ask, uh, ask faithful Abraham, who is your father in the faith. And if, and if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And the Bible says that when Abraham was an old man, way up in years, and his body now dead and Sarah, his wife's womb, now dead, they, they stood in faith and believed God and they had a child. And then that man, Abraham, after Sarah died, he remarried, and he had a number of other kids. Now that dead body didn't stay dead because he got on the right stuff. And you know what it was? Believing God and believing what God had said that he was able to do. Amen. I'm telling you, what you believe is important. Amen. Amen. And so here this guy, you know, he, he, he gets free, and then the spirit comes back, and it says that he brings seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And so just getting free is not staying free. I, 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 got a, I know a fellow, heard him preaching. He's in heaven now. But it was interesting that uh, he was in a, a visible public ministry, uh, globally public ministry, and, you know, he'd get calls, and uh, his ministry would get calls. And uh, he lived in another city, and some people were coming to his city, and they wanted to come and visit with him because one of them they felt like really needed deliverance, and really did, really did. And uh, they asked him if, if, when they got in that city where he lived, if they could come and see him. And, you know, you can't take many appointments like that. You just, you just can't do it. But he, he agreed to, but he made them promise. He said, before I, before I minister to you, I want you to promise me, and they gave him a list of things they had to do. You got to read the Bible so much. You got you to do, you got to you got to pray so much in the spirit every day. You got to, he said, if you won't agree to that, I'm not praying for you because your latter end will be worse than your former. So see, people want somebody to do it for them. Just, some, just lay hands on me. Well, they may get you free, but they won't keep you free. That's going to fall on you. There's too many people blaming too many other people for their problems. And we have to take responsibility for our own life, guys. Now, if you're going to stand before Jesus, and you will, and give an account for your actions in this earth. And you will. Even a Christian, you will stand before the Lord. It's not going to judge you heaven and hell worthy. 
but you will judge your works worthy. We're going to, we'll probably talk about that some too, not too distant future. But the thing is, if you're going to have to give an account for what you've done with this life and this body and while you were here on this earth, why don't you make your own decisions? Why don't you take responsibility for yourself if you're going to give an account for it? Why you got to let somebody else do it? Well, you know, the pastor, if the pastor had an anointing on him, I wouldn't be like this. Listen, it ain't got nothing to do with Pastor Ed's anointing. It's got to do what you do, what you've heard. Because people can preach to you, do you turn blue? And they turn blue. It won't help you. Do you do something about it? Everybody's accountable for themselves. How did I get on this? Pretty good. <laughs> Amen. And so, again, here we find this Revelation 12, 9. It says, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan, he deceives the whole world. How does he do that? He'll promise you pleasure. You do this, you do this, and you'll really enjoy life. Life will be good for you if you do this. Steal a little bit. It won't hurt you. Get ahead. Hmm. Cheat on your wife. It won't hurt you. Oh, pleasure. Hmm. Okay. So he'll promise you pleasure. He'll promise you a better life. He'll promise you fun. That's the one he pulled on me when I was a kid. This will be fun. All that fun was killing me. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's a, it's a, I promise you, my praying mother and God's grace kept me alive. I was wild as a buck. Now, I know some of you were nice and sweet and did all kinds of nice things. I, I, listen to me. Let me tell you something, parents. I know your little Johnny and Susie. I know they're sweet. I get it. My beagle's sweet. I get it. I get sweet. But let me tell you something. The first revelation you need to have about kids well, I know mine's exceptional. I know too. First revelation you need to have about all kids. You listening? They're liars. <laughs> Not my, oh yes. Let me tell you where deception starts. Parents who believe their kids are not liars. That's where it starts, right there. They all lie. Man, I lie, I, I had creative lies. Oh, you're home late. What happened? Well, you know, my car. Or you just, on the way home, you start making up the stories. You know, they're going to be, man, I mean, you know, you're home late. Why are you home late? Well, let me tell you, I couldn't help it. You know, it's just, it just, just fabricate, lie like, you heard lie like a dog. A dog can't lie that much. <laughs> Don't put it on the dog. I mean, just make up stuff. Now, I know you self-righteous ones here don't believe that, but kids, now listen, kids come out of the womb lying. <laughs> now, I know yours don't, but all the others do, okay? Now, Hebrews 3, <laughs> verse 13. He said, but exhort one another daily what is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now see, one of the ways that the devil deceives us, he deceives us to sin, but he deceives us by sin. Sin has its own deception built in it. If you sin, of course, you got deceived to think you could get by with it. At least deception at that level. At least that. You at least got deceived enough to believe it's inconsequential. You at least got deceived at that level. I can get by with it. But the truth is, sin has the ability to take you further than just the one event. It has the ability to, to block or, or to callous you or, or cause you to think you can do other things. It doesn't live alone. I'm talking about be not deceived. And I'm talking about protection from deception. Because sin, and I don't know, you might not have been as mean, mean as me. <coughs> um, 
I know you weren't. But see, there's, there's a belief you can really get by with this. You know, but you really can't. Beware, your sin will find you out. <laughs> and it does. Well, how did they know that? I don't know. I remember, well, I'm not going to tell that story. That's, that's, too, that's too revealing. I can't. But anyway, uh, New Living says it this way. He said, you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Now, I had somebody ask me this. It's a, it's a common question. You probably had it posed to you, and you probably thought it up, and it's probably one of the questions that you have. Um, if now this kind of flies in the face of some theology, I'm going to I'm going to say uh, Calvinism, hyper Calvinism. Once saved, always saved. You get in, you can't get out. I don't believe that. I don't believe anywhere in Scripture, even if you've been saved, where God takes your will away from you. So if you can will to get in, you can will to get out. Now, if you do will to get out, you're extremely, listen, theological term, you're extremely stupid in the Greek. You know what stupid is in the Greek? Meathead. <laughs> You're real dumb. Okay, so don't get out. Everybody say don't get out. Don't get out. You don't have to get out, but you can. Okay, then the question is, if you believe that, then the question comes up, well, what sin would cause you to get out? That's a good question. Okay, is it adultery? Hmm. No, he'll forgive adultery. The woman taken in adultery, they were going to stone her. He said, go and sin no more. He said, he'll forgive that. What, what, is it, what is it then? It's not sin that does it. Now, sin is serious. And it has to be confessed and it has to be repented of. But it's not sin that does it. It's not a sin that does it. It tells you right here in this passage. He said so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. See, it's hardened against God's what takes you out. That's when you believe, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to walk this Christian walk anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm through. Just a little too hard for me. A little too confining. A little too close. I want to have a little fun with life. I don't want this, I don't want this Christian thing on me. I just want to go my way. I want to eat, drink, and be merry. That's what I want to do. See, that's hardened against God. But remember this, what hardened the person against God? Sin. So it's not the sin that takes you out. It's the hardness against God that takes you out, but it's the sin that causes the hardness. So where does that accumulate? How much of it is required? I don't know. Is it one? Is it two? Is it 10? Is it a lifestyle? What is it? I don't know. But you need to be cautious about any of it. I'm talking about deception. I can do it and get by. You can't do it and get by. It'll take a toll on you. It'll take a deeper toll on you than you know it does. See, you, see the problem with it is it builds up to the point you don't even know you're own condition. You don't know how far you've drifted. That's why it's good to be sweet every day and walk with God every day and pray your prayers every day and read your Bible every day. Well, that's just too legalistic for me. No, it's protection from Deception. That's what it is. So it's not a sin that causes you to get out. He'll forgive sin. We know that. It's that you sin so much you just don't care anymore. 
That's when your heart's turning. I don't think going to church is important. Well, you're deceived. Already. At some level. Well, you know, I used to read the Bible all the time. I used to, you know, I used to listen to tapes. I used to listen to preaching all the time. I got, I got tired of that. I outgrew that. Really? I've never outgrown it. You know that old commercial, you never outgrow your need for milk? You remember that old commercial? Well, are you home? Yes. Is anybody in the house? Yes. You remember that old commercial? Yes. You don't have to remember it, but there was a commercial like that. <laughs> okay. Well, did you know the Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby? So you never outgrow your need for milk. You might not be on the meat, but at least get on the milk. But get you some Bible word every day. That's, a, that's your protection. That's not the only thing, but it is a part of your protection against deception. Amen. We see in uh, Romans six twenty three, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, when you see that, what, what does that mean? Well, the wages, you know what wages are. Wages are pay. Okay, so the wages of sin is death. Okay, you, you got to define death. Death, obviously, one day we're going to all physically die. I mean, if Jesus tarries. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that to judgment. We're all going to physically go that way. Nobody, as the saying goes, gets out of this world alive. You're going to go that way. All right. But so people have a, a one dimensional because of that. Are you home? Yes. Are you listening to me? Yes. They have a one dimensional look or concept of death. Death is an event. But death is not just an event. Death is a personality. Death is the personality of the author of death. Death is the devil. And he is the author of all death. So anything that has death on it or has a tone of death in it is death. So the wages of sin is not to die physically at the end of your life. It is to experience some form of death while you live. The wages of sin is deadly. It has death associated with it. Amen. I mean, it has its own judgment, in a sense, built in it. All sickness is death. I mean, you're not dead yet, but sickness is a form of the encro encroachment of death. I'm going to meddle with you right now, all you anti-prosperityites. Poverty is an expression of death. It is demoralizing. It is dehumanizing. It is oppressing. It brings with it all kinds of other things that you can't imagine. It destroys human dignity. It destroys everything about a human that's good and right. Poverty is an expression of death. Period. God wants you to flourish. You're going to tell me there's a poverty, there's a poverty area in heaven? Well, you know, over there on the other side of the tracks, just, you know, out, right, right on the other side of that pearly gate, right over there. Right over there is Happy Holler. <laughs> I don't think so. Mm -mm. No, there's no happy holler in heaven. There's probably not any hollers in heaven. And for those of you watching online and are not from this part of the world, holler is, it works in East Tennessee. <laughs> and those of you around here know exactly what it is. And those of you that don't, I would say look it up in the dictionary, but you won't find it. 
It's a good colloquialism. It's something we use around here. It's a hollow, okay? A place. You, you follow what I'm talking about? Wrong side of the tracks. Amen? Well, heaven doesn't have one of those. You're all on the right side of the tracks. There are probably no tracks in heaven. Hmm. Unless you built one in your backyard or whatever, you, you know. I don't know how it works. I'm stretching right now. But what I'm getting at is poverty is the work of death. Strife is the work of death. Lack of peace is the work of death. Choose, you know when the Bible says choose life, that's not just something you stick on your bumper sticker. It's talking about in every, every area of your life and everything you're exposed to and everything you touch, everything, everything you think. Choose life. Choose what life gives. Life brings peace. Life brings joy. Life brings the fullness of the Spirit. Life brings happiness. Life brings life. And all that goes with it. Therefore, choose life. That's what the scripture says to do. So it's more than just, see, the wages of sin is death, that's for sure. But it's not just the event that comes at the end of your life. It's everything that you touch every day. The wages of sin will kill you. It'll kill your joy. It'll kill your peace. It'll kill everything about your dignity, your walk with God. I'm talking about deception. I'm talking about how it works. When you live at home with a spirit of a rage on a household, you're living under the umbrella of death. And you need to stop it. God didn't tell you to live full tilt, full blown temper tantrums all the time. If you if you live in that way, you live in, I'm gonna tell you, it's 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 sin. Don't call it anything else. Call it what it is. Well, I can't help it. You can help it. Yes, you can help it. You don't have to live that way. You choose that. You choose that life. You know, why do you have to put it on everybody else? You say it all the time. You get up in the morning and pull the shades down, not up. You living under that oppression all the time. That's not life. That's something else. And you need to get it off of you. It's destroying you. Don't you understand it? And it's destroying relationships around you. You wonder why. And I'm, I'm meddling now. <laughs> you wonder why you can't keep a job and nobody wanting you pouting self around them all the time. Well, they're just, they're all against me. Well, <laughs> yeah, they want to get rid of you. You're killing them all. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I know, but I'm, you know, I didn't call any names. I'm just talking about how it works. Here comes Mr. Negative. Well, I'm running for the tall grass. You can have him, you know. Hmm. How'd I get on this? I know it is, but anyway. Hebrews 11, verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, now, it, you know, that was a choice. Moses had a lot of choices. He could have chose the way of the palace. He could have chose the way of, of the Pharaoh. He could have chosen that. He was raised in that environment. He said, choosing rather to suffer the affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So sin has pleasure for a little while, but it'll kill you. See, that's Satan's deception. Do this. You'll enjoy it. Your mind will be expanded. Here, smoke this. It will expand your creative energy. It'll kill you. You want me to give you the other, the other side? Yeah, it'll kill you. Well, I, I believe I'm better when I do that. I believe you're more stupid when you do that. <laughs> God doesn't want anything that controls your mind but Him and you. 
You don't need that mind expanding, mind altering, whatever. So Satan's deception is to promise you a feel good, a greater experience. You quit looking over the fence, mister. Because that grass is not any greener over there. You got her home with you. You wouldn't like what you got. I've counseled too many. I know that story. Oh, this is the chance of a lifetime. Yeah, it's the chance of a death time is what that is. Deception is how Satan does what he does. Am I doing okay? Yes. I'm going too slow, aren't I? I should hurry through this. We're giving out t-shirts at the door. I survived. You're going to make it. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. Ouch. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth, 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 truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own, uh, of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Now, do you see how many times here it says he's a liar, the father of lies. He tells lies. He's a liar. He's a liar. He's a liar. He's a liar. There's no truth in him. Everybody say no truth is in him. So... The big lie is, oh, your mind will be expanded. Oh, this will be better for you. Cheat on your wife. Cheat on your husband. It'll be so much better. The wages of sin is not really death. Hath God said, what did he tell Eve? The big lie. The father of lies. So he's a liar, and if you listen to him, You'll wreck your life. Period. You got to do it his way. You got to do it God's way. He said, and Jesus said, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. See, the, the, the deception was so strong that when Jesus would even tell them the truth, they couldn't hear it. Galatians 4 says, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? See, the lie is so prevalent that when you tell people the truth, they can't even hear it. I mean, the truth hit them around the face. They can't see it. This will kill you. No, it won't. You're dead. I remember my cousin. I mean, it's a true story. Uh, you know, I'm a kid. And, and he told me to stick my finger in a light socket. <laughs> I did it. It was the big lie. <laughs> Believe me, I did it. It's like, you know, my, my hair, you know, my, you know, you're lit up. I mean, here you are. It's a wonder it did key. I mean, you know, but yeah, yeah my cousin. We got, I got cousin stories. You have any? Yeah, stick your finger in the light socket. Just laugh. I could tell you another one about that too, but I won't. I don't have time. But anyway, Satan. Uh, it says he abode not in the truth. There's no truth in him. He spoke a lie. He is a liar and the father of lies. And the antidote for a lie is the truth. I said the antidote for a lie is the truth. Amen. Now what did, what did we see in, in John 14, 6? Jesus saith, Jesus saith, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The truth and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. The antidote for deception is the truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth. So your antidote for deception is Jesus. And people who don't know him are living the lie. They're living the fairy tale. They're living the deception. And how does Jesus express himself to us? That's a good question, is it not? John 17, 17, you, do, you learning anything? Yes. You been helped a little bit? Yes. I'm talking to you about any of the series, Be Not Deceived. Jesus said, don't be, I, as your pastor, responsibly to you, am telling you how to not be deceived. That is my job, to tell you how to do this. Explaining it is as detailed as I can. Laying it on the platter. If you can't eat this, you need to get a new fork. Because it's easy. 
Amen. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. And then he said, okay, how do you do that? Thy word is truth. You're going to know Jesus. You're going to know him through the word. He is the word made flesh and dwelt among us. The antidote for deception is Jesus Christ and the word of God. Now we've talked about this. Now this is, I think, the fourth message in this series. And we've brought this as clearly as we can bring it. So the Bible to you is not an optional book. It is your protection against deception. And anointed preaching is your protection against deception. Exposure to truth is your protection against deception. And so again, Matthew 24, 4, Jesus said, let no man deceive you. So he doesn't want us to be deceived. So our protection against deception is the truth of the scripture, the word of God. Now I'm going to do a message on this in a little more detail than I'm doing it now. But the word of God is our final authority for life. Final authority. Everybody say final authority. The word of God is again, your protection against deception. It is your guide for life. The wages of sin is death. When you choose life, you choose this book. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, you, well then you, there's, if you don't believe something you see in Scripture, there's, there's one or two things wrong. Either you don't understand what you read, which that can happen. There are things I don't understand. I see it and it's like, what? You know, and you have to study. You have to scratch. You have to dig around. And then, or you just, can I be blunt? You're just nuts. <laughs> you, either just, you either just don't know what you're looking at or you're just nuts. If you see it and won't do it, then you're just, say, I'm not bright. No, don't say that. <laughs> say, I'm getting brighter. Say that. <laughs> Bright light, you know. He's the light of the world. Okay, I, I know. I'm taking you places you don't need to go. Matthew 22, 29. Jesus answered and said to them, you do err. Everybody say err. Err. E-R-R. Err. -R, air. You do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. Now, that's an that's a, a and B part. Number one, it says you get in error because you don't know the Scriptures. And another way you get in error is because you don't know the power of God. Now that word power right there is the word dunamis in the Greek, which is the word that Jesus used, said, go to tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. He's talking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. So you got to know the scriptures and you got to know the power of God. Now I'm probably going to do some more extensive teaching on this power of God part because you need to have Holy Spirit discernment to understand deception. You need to have the gifts of the Spirit operating in your life a little bit. You need to have the Holy Spirit present with you. You need to spend time with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now that's another story, another message for another day. But we'll deal with that a little bit more. You okay? Okay, but he said, do you do err not knowing the Scripture? Now he said, that, of course, the Scripture, the Word, we got to know it. But now, if you read that verse, now the New English translation, it says this way. Are you listening? Are you listening? Yes. Prove it to me. Okay, are you listening? All right. Sometimes I think you're sleeping. Nudge your neighbor and say, quit sleeping. All right. Jesus answered them, he said, you are deceived because you do not, now listen, King James said, you do err. New English said, you are deceived. Hmm. Because you don't know the scripture or the power of God. He said, the reason that people get in deception is they don't know the scripture. They don't know the Bible. Well, how do you know the Bible? At least open it and read it. Open it and read it. 
That's where it comes. Well, you know, I know the Bible says study to show yourself approved. Well, I know it says that. But some of us, we're not to that point. We're not studying much. You just need to read. Reading's a good open door. Just read it. Some of you, now I'm not fussing at you. I'm talking to you. You've never read the Bible one time through. The Bible says the Holy Spirit brings all things together, all, all things to your remembrance whatsoever the Father said. He can't bring anything to your remembrance if you didn't put it in there. You've got to at least help this out a little bit. Amen? So, uh, the Scripture says that our protection is twofold, knowing the Scripture and the power of God. Amen? I said amen. amen. Praise God. And so, uh, again, in Ephesians 4, in verse number 14, that you henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So there are people that Satan uses and events that Satan uses where they lie in wait. They lie like a, like a tiger. Have you ever um, done any research on a tiger and, and as a predator, as a hunter? They're amazing animals to me. This is one of the most beautiful animals ever made. And they're amazing. And they hunt different than lions. Lions hunt in, uh, they, they got, you know, a, a group. And they hunt in, in a pride, they call it, you know, herd, but they're not, they don't call them herds. You know, they're pride. There's a, there's a pride of lions. And it's usually the females that hunt. And they bring it back to the males. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I don't know what that means to anything, but just it's a good thought. <laughs> but <laughs> I couldn't help it. But tigers, they don't hunt in groups. They hunt alone. And they're so amazing. They're so fast. You see, ever seen a little old house cat and how quick they are? Well, a tiger is like that, but they're big. I mean, they're quick. Lions are too, but they, there's a twitch factor in a cat that you're just, you ever heard quick as a cat? That's why that way they got a twitch factor that just, you know, they're, they're, they're amazing. And a tiger is so strong in one, in one hit, it can break the neck of a water buffalo like that. Amazing. Satan goes about as a roaring lion. See, he lies in wait. He, he, lies, he lies in wait in, in his stealth, in his deceptive nature to see what he can spring. But see, it says that he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you know what? He can't devour everybody. Just because deception is rampant doesn't mean it's yours. See, he can't, he can't get who he can't deceive. He got to deceive you before he can get you. He's got to he's got to he's got to make you believe he's not there, hide in the dark. Make you believe you're okay. He's got to deceive you. That's how he does what he does. And so, um, <laughs> so the Bible tells us in uh, Ephesians six eleven. I'm hurrying. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Classic. He said, "Put on." God's whole armor. Everybody say armor. armor. The armor of the heavy armed soldier, which God supplies, that you may be able to successfully to stand up against all the strategies, now listen, and deceits of the devil. So God says he gives you armor that allows you to stand up against Satan's deceit. So if he gives you armor, you've got to put it on. Amen. Now listen. Amen. Are you home? Okay. Now he says that he gives us armor to stand against the wiles of the devil. And you go down here in verse number 14, Ephesians 6. He says, stand therefore, hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth. So the truth is your armor against deceit. The truth is your armor 
against deceit. Jesus, these are not plays on words, guys. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is your protection against deception. There is protection that is given to us. We don't have to be deceived. There's no reason that we have to be deceived. And I know that a lot of people, you know, when you talk about this, they get this thing on them. Well, you know, deceit's everywhere. The devil's hidden. You know, the news media, there's propaganda. There's this, there's all that. You don't have to be deceived. You, you don't have to be deceived. I know all those lies are out there. I know they're everywhere. I know they're a dime a dozen. There's more lies than truth. I know that. But that doesn't mean you have to buy it and you have to own it. You have an antidote against deception. You can discern it. You can listen to the news. And, I, and I've told Nora, I said, that guy right there, I'm talking about the guy on the news. I told Nora, I said, that guy is demon possessed. You couldn't put that much word salad in somebody's mouth without the help of an evil spirit. That guy is demon possessed. Why do I want to get my news from him? There's a knob or a button or something. Maybe knobs are old fashioned. Dude, you just hit a button. Turn that guy off. <laughs> You heard the story about when remotes started getting fashionable and back before, you know, back when I was a kid, you had to actually, you know, go and do the knob thing and buttons and all that stuff. And uh, the guy, he just got one of these newfangled TVs that had a remote, remote control. And the neighbors went over and he's showing off his remote control. And the guy leaves his neighbor's house and he said, can you believe that guy? All this stuff. He said, can you believe a guy that, that's too lazy to tell his wife to turn off the TV? <laughs> I'm sorry, Theron, it just comes out. Amen. That's what you have when you have all these memories of the past, you know. But uh, I remember when that actually happened, you know, when remotes started first coming out. And I thought, I don't need one of those. <laughs> I have the house of a lion. <laughs> Don't you give her that mic. Don't you turn her microphone off. <laughs> Whatever you do. She's giving me the look. Well, it'll be. I wonder what lunch will be today. Mm. Would you bow your heads with me in just a minute? Father, we've been having a little fun here and, and all, and it is fun, it's, but it's all true. And you have given us a protection against deception. We don't have to be fearful of this world and this life on this planet. You've given us all the equipment that we need to overcome, to walk in victory, to walk in the life and the light and the glory of God. <laughs> Father, I pray for this congregation, this house, and every person listening to me, I pray that that power of deception be broken. Father, w the reason we're digging around in this is to expose how Satan does it. But we, Father, we're not just exempt because we're Christians. We're exempt because we're knowledgeable Christians. We just got to know the truth <laughs> and know how it works. And I pray, Father, for that power to, to just right now penetrate the life of every person listening to me. Lord, that they be not tossed about by the cunning craftiness whereby Satan lies in wait to deceive, but reveal to them the truth in Jesus' name. Now, while we're in that attitude of prayer and while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you've never met Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you need to do that right now, right where you're at, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the room. And again, we're in that attitude of prayer, respect the space of everybody around you. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or if you're say, I'm saved, but I'm not walking with him. And you want today to be the day that you change that. The day you receive him. The day you recommit to him. Would you lift up your hand right now and say, pray for me, Pastor. I want today to be that day for me. All right, I see you all over the house. Just lift up your hand. I want to pray with you. I'm not going to call you the front. I just want to pray with you. I see you up here. Anyone else should say, that's me. I want you to pray with me. Anyone else before we pray. Now, if you're, if you're watching online, you've got a hand there in your heart. I can't see you, 
but God can see you. Just lift that hand in your heart up to Him. You may want to lift your physical hand if you're in a place where you can do it. But right there, you're just calling out to God right now. Now, Father, I pray for each of these that have expressed their desire to know you and know you better and know you more and enter into a relationship with you, with you, Father, today. And I pray for them right now that you meet them where they are, fulfill in their heart everything their heart cries out for right now in Jesus' name. Now, everybody pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. I repent of my sin. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. Now let's all just lift our hands to heaven and thank God he hears us when we pray. Father, you never turn your ear away from us. You're always there for us. You always listen. You'd never in any way not hear a prayer like that. Now let's all stand together. And if you're watching online, you might not be able to do the things that we're doing here in the house. But I want everybody here in the house to, to very deliberately tell at least three people that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Would you do that? Amen. Now, if you're watching online, if you're around somebody and you can tell them, do that. But you may not be around anybody. You may be there alone. Let us know because with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's important that you tell somebody.